So that's how it all started. And eventually led me to finding suspects because of what the animals told me on crime scenes. And that sounds, I know that sounds crazy. Some people are like, oh my gosh, she's totally nuts. But that's what happened. And I thought it was crazy too. And I couldn't believe that it was happening. But, you know, I thought if I can get this kind of information from an animal, what else can they tell me? If they can tell me who the aggressor was in a domestic violence situation, if they could tell me where a suspect is hiding, if they can tell me where a lost child is in the woods, what else can they tell me? And I was fascinated by this concept that animals can share sometimes much more accurate eyewitness information than a human because they don't have agendas. Welcome to a Broader Lands podcast. Best-selling author and animal communicator and psychic medium, Karen Anderson. Welcome to Broader Lands podcast. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this. No, I have. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I know uh, when we talked about some dates, you sent me one on the 12th, and today's a special day um, where my father uh, moved on from this uh, physical form. And uh, yeah, it's just a good memory and a good time to just reflect and appreciate my father's life and life itself. So thank you for being on. There's no such thing as coincidence, right? So what better day to honor him than for you and I to, to get together and, and share our message? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my first question is about your early life. I mean, you you say you're an animal communicator, psychic medium. Maybe you can um, define those for us, for people that may not be aware of what that is. Sure. Well, um, a psychic and a medium are two different things. A psychic can tend to know things about your your past, your future events, and a medium is actually somebody who channels a spirit from the afterlife. So those are two really different terms, and you can be psychic but not a medium, or you can be a medium but not psychic, or you can be both, which is what I happen to be. And then another layer on that is the animal communication part, which is very simply the ability to understand what the animals are thinking and feeling and to be able to deliver messages from them to their moms and dads. I call you their moms and dads. I don't think, I don't think anybody owns, we don't own them. They own us, right? I mean, if anyone owns (laughs) anyone, (laughs) I know mine own me, that's for sure. So um, those are like three different titles all rolled into one and covering many different types of abilities. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for those your books. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm reading The Amazing Afterlife right now of animals. You also have um, Hear All Creatures and The Pet I Can't Forget, your latest one. Yes, absolutely. So Hear All Creatures is the first book. The Amazing Afterlife of Animals is the second one. And then I just released The Pet I Can't Forget. And they all are full of stories from animals and messages from the afterlife and signs. And it's it's really, a it chronicles my life and how I discovered my abilities. Yeah, thank you. I started, op- uh, I opened up The uh, Amazing Afterlife of Animals in uh it's it's amazing, and I appreciate it. It's a very easy read, and I love the way you break it down. Um, makes it more, uh, you know, uh, it's it's more. It makes it more. Um, it paints a picture in my mind better, you know, and I, I could understand it better. So I appreciate that. And uh, you talk about your early life, um, and you talk about being able to communicate with animals, and you talk about your pet prints. Maybe you can start off right there with us. Sure. The earliest memory I have going as far back in childhood as I can remember, is being able to understand my childhood dog, who was a tri-colored collie. He was mostly black and white, looked just like glassy, but he had a little bit of brown on him. 
And I could understand him on a level that I thought everybody knew. I didn't realize that I was doing something different or unique. So I just assumed everyone knew what he was thinking and feeling. And I didn't think there was anything different about it until I started to receive a little bit of a kickback from my parents. They weren't quite comfortable with the information I was sharing with them. A five or six year old child should not know these things about (laughs) the dog and what was wrong with him and health issues. And, And then I also started seeing Um, spirits of loved ones that I had never met before. So that's where it all started. Prince was my very first friend. He was my very first animal that I connected with. And uh, he's very special to me. You also mentioned that your parents uh, didn't um, believe that you can communicate with them. Am I correct? Well, they didn't know what to do with that. They thought (laughs) it was... (laughs) From a very early age, I learned that it wasn't acceptable or they they didn't want me to do it, which is really unfortunate. And I give my mom a bad time about it now. And she's like, you know, I don't even remember. So (laughs) uh, she puts it out of her mind. But it's truly one of those things that if a child feels like their, their parents don't approve of what they're doing, then those abilities are are squashed or hidden or you know not nurtured. So I I looking back, I wish I would have been nurtured along that path. But instead, I learned to keep it to myself that I was doing something I shouldn't be doing, and so I didn't tell anyone. I just kept it between me and the animals. Were you raised in like in a religious background? Not at all. Um, we had a, a Catholic upbringing. And, and it wasn't, you know, strict Catholic, but we had that background. So it wasn't um, terribly religious. And um, I will just say that, you know, growing up, I felt like I never fit in anywhere. Like there wasn't, I always felt like I was different than everyone else. And I've, I've always had that fish out of water feeling. So I think it was just more or less the... Um, that my parents were like, oh, it's Karen in her crazy imagination. You know, they always told me I had an overactive imagination. And so I just kind of kept doing what I was doing and moving along and chose not to share it until much later in life, of course. <laughs> yeah, I asked that because sometimes uh, religion will tell you it's a no-no. It's the devil or whatever, bad spirits and uh, kind of controls people's thinking at times. I, I say this because I recently was talking to uh, a, a group of women that I see every day and uh, started talking about your book because we love animals and uh, we're walking our dogs and I spooked them, I guess. <laughs> so you can't just talk to anybody about this stuff. You you can't. You have to be sensitive to other people's belief systems. And I honor that. And I was, uh, like I said, I was not brought up in an overly religious family. And, you know, I don't want anyone to judge me. So I don't judge anyone else. So whatever their beliefs are, I honor them. And I've never tried to convince anybody of what I do or defend what I do, because that would mean what I do needs to be defended. And it doesn't. It just simply is. And for those who are enlightened, for those who understand that there's more to life than the physical realm here, uh, I'm here for those people. And I truly am you know, extremely excited to share what I've learned because it has changed my life in so many amazing and positive ways. And I want to share that with others, especially when it comes to losing a beloved pet and all of those deep, emotional, painful feelings we have that are, you know, we can't avoid them. They're there. Even for me, they're there. But learning to communicate with animals has certainly helped me move forward into the healing process much quicker, and I don't mean fast, but just easier, I guess, than before I understood what the animals felt and saw and experienced in the afterlife. And it's truly magical and amazing. And and that's what I want to share. That's what I want my readers and my followers to know is that the love continues. It doesn't end at physical death. Yeah, thank you. I uh, I guess I forgot. I try to have a conversation, and I forget some people just ain't attuned to that, or it's not they're not into that, and it's okay. 
but I just can't speak to it <laughs> to, speak to to anyone about this stuff. So um, this is one of the reasons why I enjoy this podcast because I get to connect with beautiful human beings like yourself. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I have to be careful sometimes if I go out and meet people that that don't know me because they'll say, "Oh, Karen, what do you do for a living?" And then you have this like moment where you want to say the truth of what you do and you want to just put it out there. And then you have this other moment of, well, is everyone going to run out the door, you know, screaming, ah! <laughs> <laughs> get away from her. You know? So there's this tiny little pause. And I used to hesitate before sharing my, my background. And now I just simply put it out there. And if, it, you know what? Almost everybody has the same reaction. They'll, they'll kind of cock their head and go, oh, really? You know, they kind of like, like look at me and then they want to know more. Oh, you should talk to my dog or you should talk to my cat or, oh, I need you. Or, you know, I'll get one of those reactions. But it's it's really interesting to see what, <laughs> what their responses are. <laughs> I bet. Do you have any other examples you can give us from being a, a young little girl? Um, starting to develop this intuition or, or being realizing that you can communicate or feel other animals? Well, um, I think one of the one things that stands out to me, and I wrote about this in Here All Creatures, is uh, as a very young child, I sensed that there was a medical issue, something very wrong with Prince, my dog that I talked about earlier. And I felt that there was something very painful going on in the, the abdomen I actually felt those pains myself. So I was experiencing what my dog was experiencing. And um, I was very concerned and I thought Prince was going to die. And I was very, very upset. And I shared with my mom the next morning that um, he needed to go see the doctor, that his tummy hurt. And I showed her the area of the abdomen on me where, where it was hurting. And when they took Prince in, it turned out that he was having a pancreatic attack. So I was right on the money with what I was receiving as, you know, a five-year-old child, which I think about it now, it's kind of mind boggling, but you know, kids are so open. They have no preconceived ideas that talking to animals isn't possible. So their programming is such that you know, like for me, I grew up with Disney films and cartoons and Bugs Bunny. All the animals talked. Every single animal I watched on TV could talk with the exception of Lassie. But of course, Lassie knew Timmy was in the well and all that stuff. But still, um, I had no concept that that wasn't possible. It, it was my life. And I lived only 20 minutes from Disneyland in Southern California. So we went there all the time. And it was just a magical place for me. And it just really um, carved out this belief in my head that animals could talk just like humans. So I just let the messages happen. I, I never knew that wasn't a thing <laughs> until later. You can also communicate with human beings, right? Yeah, yeah, the interesting part about that is I never started out wanting to connect with humans. I was just all about the animals, just me and the animals. I love them. I want to understand them on a higher, more spiritual level. They, they're they so wise. They know so much about us, things you wouldn't even imagine <laughs> they know about us. So I never intended to connect with departed humans. But what happened, Boo Boo, was that during my communication sessions with animals, departed human spirits started to show up in those sessions. So it was almost kind of forced on me. I had to figure out how to, how to handle that. And I would sense them. I would see them. I could hear them. But it was much different than communicating with an animal. So that was a whole learning process too, but they just showed up. So I thought it was the polite thing to do to deliver their messages too. If they wanted to show up during a session, then obviously they have something they want to share, right? Yeah. You know, that's interesting because um, you went from that to becoming a deputy to going back to being a psychic 
and a medium and an animal communicator. Maybe you could walk us into what happened and how did you become a sheriff? I know, what a crazy path, right? So <laughs> I've always been, ever since I was little, I've always been um, very much about doing what I want to do, pursuing my dreams. I've been a very motivated um, human ever since I can remember. If I set out to do something, nothing was going to get in my way. And that just continued throughout adulthood. Now, I had, as a kid, I had pushed those animal communication abilities down and, you know, life happened. And I actually got into the mortgage business of all things. And I spent almost 18 years uh, working with interest rates and loan amounts and percentages. And I just didn't like it. It was not fulfilling. It was it just didn't fuel my soul. And I felt like I was missing something. I felt like a part of my life was empty, but I didn't know what it was. I couldn't figure it out. So it turned out that my uh, business partner in the mortgage industry, we, we owned a mortgage company, was embezzling. And I found he was a good friend of mine too. So it was an extremely difficult time. I ended up having to file bankruptcy, close down the mortgage company, and I found myself unemployed and not knowing what to do with myself. I was really lost. It was, it was just, I didn't know which direction to go in. So I was out in my corral one day. This was in a little town called Bailey, Colorado. And I was um, mucking the stalls with my horses. And for those who don't know what that is, that's scoop and poop. And um, so glamorous, I know. And I just felt this sense of belonging. I felt this, like someone came down and just hugged me. And I felt so good. And I thought, you know what? I need to be working with the animals. I don't know what, but I need to be working. Get back with the animals again. It was always my love. And I thought, light bulb moment, that if I could muck stalls for others, I could earn a living mucking stalls. So I set out, put an ad in the paper, and I became the corral gal. And my sole purpose was to go around and scoop poop for a living. And I loved it. I, it's crazy, right? But I absolutely loved it. I go from corporate America to mucking out stalls. I couldn't be happier. I could set my own schedule. I got to be around the horses and the farm animals. Absolutely beautiful country up in Colorado. So happy. And that's where I became awakened about my animal communication abilities. And I started practicing with my own pets and the animals that I was taking care of. So that's kind of what leads me up to law enforcement. I know that's a big jump, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big leap. You know, what's funny was I was going to introduce you as a manure cleanup specialist, like you mentioned in the book. There you go. <laughs> I would not be offended. That's quite all right. Uh, you also mentioned in your book about, um, solving uh, crimes or, or uh, catching suspects with uh, animal communication, which I thought was interesting. Right. So the lead in from um, poop scooper <laughs> to uh, deputy sheriff. So in the town of Bailey, uh, there, there was um, an animal control facility and I felt this incredible need to drive unknown forces pushing me, if you will, that I needed to volunteer at this animal control facility. I had never volunteered for anything in my life, okay? T total transparency, never. Never done any volunteer work before. Something led me to the door of this animal control facility and I started volunteering. I started out by cleaning kennels, you know, taking care of the animals. And then I began riding along with the animal control officers to go out on calls. Well, boo boo, I caught the bug. I loved that. I loved going with the, the officers and rescuing animals and making sure the animals were cared for and getting them out of, uh, you know, a bad situation. I love that. And um, the animal control facility was run by the sheriff's department. 
It was under the umbrella of the sheriff's department. So the sergeant had heard what a good job that I was doing with the animal control. And he approached me one day and he said, you know, uh, you'd make a really good deputy and we would love to have you on the department. What do you think about that? And I thought, (laughs) you're crazy, right? Me, a deputy. I'd never even fired a gun. It was never on my radar. So I couldn't stop thinking about what he said. And I started riding along with the deputies now. So I was riding along with animal control. I was riding along with the deputies. And I was like, you know what? I can do this. I can really do this. And it felt so fulfilling. Like I was giving something back to my community. Talk about community service, right? (laughs) Well, that's how it all started. And eventually led me to finding suspects because of what the animals told me on crime scenes. And that sounds, I know that sounds crazy. Some people are like, oh my gosh, she's totally nuts. But that's what happened. And I thought it was crazy too. And I couldn't believe that it was happening. But, you know, I thought if I can get this kind of information from an animal, what else can they tell me? If they can tell me who the aggressor was in a domestic violence situation, if they could tell me where a suspect is hiding, if they can tell me where a lost child is in the woods, what else can they tell me? And I was fascinated by this concept that animals can share sometimes much more accurate eyewitness information than a human because they don't have agendas. They tell you the truth. They're just honest. They see something they show it to you or tell you it's not, uh, um, it's, it's an unbiased opinion, basically. A number of examples in the book. And one of them was with the deer in the woods, right? A deer's walking by. Yes, absolutely. One of the first times this happened to me where I thought, wow, this is really crazy. Um, I got a call that I was on duty and there was a rollover accident that involved a suspect of, that we thought to have a felony warrant that was considered armed and dangerous. It was p- pitch black, middle of summer, um, up in the Rocky Mountains. There's no street lights. This is a mountain region. So it's just, you know, the bare light of the summer sky at night. And we arrived on scene and, and the, Sergeant told me to stay on perimeter, which they left to go look for the suspect on foot. And I was told to stay there at the scene. Well, that was mainly because I was a rookie and they didn't want me messing anything up. So they made me stay on perimeter. I was the only female officer on the department. So I had a lot of proving to do. And um, basically I stayed there just to make sure, you know, that the crime scene was protected there. And as I'm sitting in the dark in my patrol car, I'm getting more and more nervous because I'm thinking I'm a sitting duck. If this suspect is here somewhere hiding, it's a big field. They can see me. I'm right here in the patrol car. I mean, that's really a bad place to be. So I got out of the patrol car and I was just kind of walking through this field full of tall grass And all of my fellow officers were to my left. And a small herd of deer came walking through the field. Now, they weren't concerned by my presence because they knew I wasn't a threat. So they were just kind of eating the tall grass, dipping their heads down and looking up and eating the grass and kind of walking through. And as I'm sitting there, I'm beginning to get more and more nervous. I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, where is this guy? What am I going to do if I find him? Where is he hiding? And as I had that thought in my head, one of the deer popped its head up, looked right at me. We made eye contact. And I heard the words in my head, logs over by the logs. It was in my voice, but I didn't, I didn't think that thought. And it was like, I heard it in my head, like a thought. So I snuck around behind my patrol car and over to my right, there were a bunch of fallen trees, big pine trees that had been cut down. And I thought, oh my gosh, what if he is hiding over there? What am I going to do? I mean, my heart was like pounding. I'm by myself. 
And so I sneak around in the darkness. I draw my weapon. And somewhere I got this like booming voice. And I ordered the suspect to come out with his hands up. And sure enough, out of the darkness, I see these two hands pop up. So that was an absolute turning point for me as far as what animal communication can do and what's possible. I was blown away. And so, of course, you know, all of my fellow officers come, I radioed that I had them at gunpoint. They come racing back. Um, <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, Anderson, how'd you find him? How'd you find him? You know, way to go. You know, pat me on the back and giving me high fives. Well, there's no way I was going to tell him, oh, the deer told me. That wasn't going to happen. So I just kept it to myself. I said, oh, it was just, you know, gut instincts. Do you have other examples? Do you, is there any other ones that come to mind off the top of the head that was heart touching? Um, for the police work? Yes. Okay, um, there was one particular one that I thought was really, really incredible. Uh, we got called to um, a DOA, which is a um, deceased on arrival. So at that point, you don't know what you have. You don't know if it's um, um, self-inflicted. You don't know if it's a murder. You don't know if it's an accident. You don't know what it is, so you have to treat it like a crime scene. And it was an older gentleman who lived alone and... We went inside his house and it was a disaster. I mean, the furniture had been turned upside down and um, just a little bit of a trigger warning here. For if you're sensitive, turn the sound off. Um, there was blood everywhere on the walls, uh, on the furniture, just blood spatter and blood everywhere. And he was very bloodied and he looked like he'd been beaten up, like somebody had really tried to hurt this man. So um, we assumed it had been an assault and murder. And so we were treating it like a murder and we were waiting for the coroner to show up and I was on perimeter again, go figure, stick Karen on perimeter. Um, and um, I'd noticed that there was a, an old hound dog out back in his backyard on the deck, just sitting there this hound dog was sitting out back on the, the backyard decking. So I went around back. Of course, I love animals. So I was back there and I was just hanging out with the dog. And I thought, well, I wonder if this dog can share any information. So I started to ask him, and this is quietly in my mind. It's not like you and I are talking right here, but I'm asking him, you know, if, if he knew what happened to his dad, and the dog shared that um, he heard some bangs and bumps and thumps, and then everything was quiet. But he said his dad was by himself, that no one else was there. So I thought that was very interesting because I asked him, was there someone else here? And it was no. He showed me that his dad was alone in, in the house. And we all assumed this was... Um, a murder, an assault. And, and um, this dog is telling me, no, it was not. And so um, I kept it to myself. I didn't tell anybody. And after the coroner did the um, exam, we later found out that the man was indeed by himself, but he had been um, having epileptic seizures and he wasn't taking his medication and he had a series of epileptic seizures, and that's why there was everything was strewn all around. Is he was seizing, and in his whole place got messed up, as I mentioned earlier, and it was not murder. So that was really profound to me because all of us there, we just assumed someone had done this, and the dog said no. In your book, you, you mentioned that uh, the suspects got younger and you started to get a little older and you eventually leave the <laughs> the deputy uh, department. And don't, you... tell, don't tell anybody. I'm getting <laughs> older. Um, I was not a young uh, deputy. Uh, when I graduated the police academy, I was 36. So that's 
you know, the people coming out of the academy, they're like in their early 20s, right? And here I am, 36, coming out of the academy. So, you know, by the time I got to be close to 40, I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm getting older. Suspects are getting younger. I'm at 8,000 foot elevation. I'm carrying around 25 pounds a year um, when I'm on duty. And I realized that I was going to have to figure out, you know, what am I going to do? There were no desk jobs available and I didn't want a desk job in the sheriff's office. So yeah, I, I had to face reality there. That was a reality check in a big way. And you eventually um, go back to being an animal communicator? Yeah, well, I decided that um, my true love again was the animals. So, and I was so fascinated by what I was finding out on crime scenes that animals could actually share detailed information that was so accurate. And I thought, you know, this fascinates me. I'm going to learn everything I possibly can. I'm going to practice, 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 practice. So again, everything about me is drive and determination. I'm, if I want it, I go after it and I go after it completely 110%. And that's what I did with animal communication. I dove in and I just began, began practicing as many times as I could possibly practice with as many different people. And I wasn't charging for my services at the time, but I just wanted to, to really learn what I was doing before I became quote unquote, a professional. So that's how, that's how it became my permanent job. That's awesome. So how does it look for you when you're giving a reading or you're, you know, you're doing an animal communication do you see it in images or do you hear voices? Uh, how, how does it all look? How does it all work when you're giving someone a reading? I'll give you, for instance, okay, this is a real good example. So let's say right now I ask you to picture in your mind the Statue of Liberty. So you're looking at me, right? But you can see in your mind the Statue of Liberty. She's got that torch in her hand. She's got the spiky things on her hat. She's got the long whatever she's wearing. You can see that, but you're still looking at me. That's what it looks like. It's like a transparency over what you're looking at. Or sometimes it's just a flash, like a when you uh, the old-fashioned cameras, when a flash would go off. It's really fast. So you have to be paying attention because in the blink of an eye, you can miss something. So that's one way that animals can send a message. So like if you're a, if you have pets at home, you may think, you know, that, oh, well, animals can't talk. Well, how many times have you been prompted to do something because you simply knew that your animal needed something or wanted something? Now, this is aside from physical cues or whining or crying. You just knew it. It just came to you. You know, maybe they wanted to go outside and you just sensed that they needed to go outside. Maybe you sensed there was something wrong with them and took them to the vet and found out there was something wrong with them. There are moments in our lives that we disregard as uh, pet parents that are actual communication happening, but we just don't realize it. And then I, what I did is I developed my clear audience abilities. Our audience is the ability to hear with an internal ear, uh, either an animal or spirit or somebody talking to you. Um, that's what I, I wanted to hear them. I wanted to hear what they were saying. So I really focused on that. So when I hear an animal, it's usually in my voice, but I know it's not my thought because like the deer, I wasn't thinking about logs. I was thinking, what am I going to do if I find this guy? Oh my gosh. So you have to realize what is your thought and what's not your thought. And that's where practice comes in. Practice, 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 practice. And then other things too, like a feeling, you know, like when I was a kid and I felt something was wrong with my dog and I felt the pain in my stomach, feelings come through. So it can be one of those things. It can be all of those things. And it just depends because all of us have those abilities and we can sharpen those abilities if we desire. It's just been over the years in the human evolution, we don't rely on those into intuitive abilities like we used to 
anymore. We rely more on our left brain, which is, you know, processing information and, you know, getting through the day and driving and uh, being at work and on computers, you know, that's very left brain activity. You know, right brain is the more intuitive, creative side. And that's where animal communication, spirit communication, mediumship, that's where the majority of that information is uh, sent and received. I'm not a brain expert, so I'm I'm generalizing here, so <laughs> but it's definitely a right brain activity. And we have to learn to switch, especially me. I went from mortgage to deputy sheriff. So I had to move from the black and white world of numbers and percentage rates and evidence and facts as a, a police officer to the more creative, intuitive energy flowing, ebbing and flowing. So it's, it's a shift of awareness. It's there. And I'm, I'm talking about my right brain here. It's there, but you have to develop it if you want to learn how to do what I do. Do you have any uh, heart touching experiences with giving readings over the years? I have so many, I would take up the next 15 hours <laughs> filling you with all the stories I have. Um, it, it has been such an incredible journey and every session was unique. And just to kind of give you some kind of um, basis, I have been communicating with animals for over 26 years now. And I've logged, this is documented in logged sessions um, with clients, 22,000. Wow. So I've heard a lot, I've experienced a lot, and I have millions of stories, and I've infused some of my most favorite and powerful stories into my books to share with my readers and to help open their awareness to this incredible world of animal communication. And I do have some favorites that I would love to share with you, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. So um, when I first started out, uh, there was a, a horse that was alive and well, and uh, I was connecting with this horse to see what it had to say. And I think the, the client was having some trouble that the horse didn't want to stop. Like there were no brakes on this horse when she was trying to ride it. It just wanted to run. Um, so I was talking to the horse about that and trying to resolve that issue or find out how we could, you know, help them understand each other better. When all of a sudden the horse said to me, apples in the air. And I thought, well, that's odd. Of course, we know horses love apples, right? But what's in the air part? You know, I didn't understand that. So I asked it again. I asked the horse, what did you say apples in the air or apples in your hair? <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was air or hair because sometimes words sound very similar. And the horse was like, no, apples in the air, apples in the air. So I have no clue what this is. So when I share that with the client, she thought for a minute and then she went, oh my gosh, I know what that is. I know what that is. And she shared that she lived on a dirt road where her neighbor down the street loved her horses. And every day, on every morning on his way to work, he would drive past her corral where her horses were. He would roll down the window of his beat up old pickup truck and he would throw apples to her horses over the fence. Now, how cool is that? You and I wouldn't say it that way, but animals will sometimes put words together to describe an experience or something that's happening to them. So that was a, a really cool moment because I realized, okay, they're going to say things their way. They're going to share a message in the way that it makes sense to them. And then it's up to us to figure out what it means. So that was, that was really cool. Apples in the air. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll never forget that because it was one of my very first messages that I had to like go, what the heck, what is apples in the air? So, and then I realized as time went on 
that there was so much that they knew about us and that they're, they were so good at um, accepting their situation or what was happening to them, especially at the end of life, where we tend to stress and obsess about the end of life, especially if we have to euthanize a beloved companion. I mean, it's terrible, right? I've had to do it so many times. And even though we know it's the right thing to do, we still it still feels so wrong. And animals were just amazing about that. They shared with me so much insight that it literally changed my thought process and how I handled euthanasia with my own animals because they they didn't hold us responsible even though we feel responsible. They just didn't see it that way. Not a single animal that I communicated with ever one time said to me, my mom or dad killed me. Or why did they end my life? I wasn't ready to go. No. Instead, the messages that I would get over and over again were tell them thank you. They helped me leave my body when it was failing. It was, it felt like a, a gift we had given them. They viewed this as part of their journey, not as something we did wrong or a horrible decision we made. Think about that. That is so powerful. If you have been in those shoes and, and had to make a decision like that, it, there's so much guilt. There's so much blame. It, you question everything that you did or didn't do for that companion. And imagine hearing a message from your companion that they were, I want to say grateful that you were able to help them leave a body that could no longer sustain them. That's huge. You know, that's just like changes everything. I still don't like to have to do that. I mean, who would want to do that? But it changed so much about how I handle things at, in end of life situations. And it helps so many of my clients heal because we get stuck in that grief. We get stuck in that blame. I did it. I carried around blame for decades because I felt responsible for an animal's death. And that can eat you up inside and cause you to not live your life fully and to live in misery or to hold back or to not get another animal again because you feel like you're a horrible parent and you don't deserve another animal and you don't want to go through that again. I mean, it can really mess with you. That's the power of animal communication is that they don't see it that way. That's a human. Those are human concepts. Animals are so much more accepting of what happens to them, even in some of the worst abuse cases I ever worked in my career, there just maybe a handful of exceptions. Most of the time, this is interesting, the animals will say to me, my mom and dad waited too long. <laughs> I was, I was ready to go <laughs> way before they were ready to let me go. So think about that. You know, we keep them here longer because we don't, we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to end their life. So we keep them here way longer than they probably should be. And I'm guilty. I've done it. Oh my gosh, I've done it many times. So I speak from experience here. But it truly is an incredible feeling to know that they trust us to manage their comfort level and we will never be judged. They will never blame us. Even if you physically caused their death, and I have a great story to share, but let me just stop for a minute. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. So <laughs> is that okay appreciate if I share that? Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Please do. Okay. I tell you, I have a million stories, but I think one of the most... Um, poignant stories I have. Um, 
animals rarely want to talk about their death or the moments leading up to their death or what happened. Like the first thing a human wants to know is, oh my God, how did they die? Like if they didn't know, if they weren't there, they want to know, they want to know the gory details. I find it so fascinating. Animals don't want to go there. That information is either not relevant or they don't want to go to a bad memory. They would much rather talk about what they love or something about you or their favorite things. And I was really shocked at the whole dynamic of how the human animal wanted to focus on everything negative and horrible and trauma and disaster and mayhem and pain and hurt and sorrow and struggle. And the animals were like, nope, don't want to go there. (laughs) I don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about something else. So here's a perfect example. A client called me. Now, these are all phone sessions. I just want to explain how this worked. I didn't have Zoom. Zoom wasn't even around back in the day. These are all phone sessions. (coughs) Excuse me. And all I would have is a picture of the animal. So I work from a picture. A picture is like having that animal's cell phone number. I can dial up their energy by gazing at the picture. That's just how I train myself. So I have the picture of the animal and all I have is the the pet's name, their age, whether they were living or departed, and um, the primary goal if, if there was a health issue or behavior problem. So this was a departed cat. And the client called in because she had unfortunately, um, been leaving for work one day, one morning, and she was late for a meeting. So she backed out of her garage without looking or checking to see where her beloved cat was. And she ran over the cat. Now the cat didn't die, um, but it was obviously injured. Uh, and they had this incredible bond. She had found him as a stray and she was alone in her life. She had nobody that really loved her And this cat, they just bonded and they spent all their time together. He was an indoor outdoor cat. And so she was, you know, completely devastated that here her cat now is, is injured and and she did it. Um, The cat ultimately um, down the road succumbed to his injuries. He was an older cat and he just never recovered. So she was just riddled with guilt and she couldn't move past it. She had been unable to go to work. She was withdrawing from friends and family. She was beating herself up. She was losing sleep at night. I mean, she was just devastated that she had caused this friend of beautiful friend that she had to cause the death. So here I come into the picture. When I connected with the cat, what amazes me is how beautifully they come through. It's like velvet. It's like silk. They come through, this energy comes through and you immediately feel the love they have for their human. It's like you love their human. You feel that love. You feel how it feels to love that human, which is really cool. So I'm sharing everything I'm getting and I'm delivering these messages about the cat and their life together. And it was so grateful to her that she had saved him and given him so much love, especially in the last part of his life. And I knew he had passed because of this accident, but I didn't know the details of it. So the cat kept showing me throughout the session, again, trigger warning for anyone who's sensitive, um, don't listen. Um, The cat kept showing me an amputated leg. Now it wasn't gross or gory or anything, but I could tell that it it was a leg, it was a human leg that was amputated. Kind of looked like a, the leg off of a doll. It was not gross or anything. And I didn't know what it meant. And I thought, well, I wonder if the cat had to have its leg amputated because it got run over. And I thought, I'm not going to say anything because she's already so upset. I'm not going to upset her anymore. So I'm not going to talk about the cat's leg being amputated. So I didn't say anything. So we're going along with the session. Boom. The cat shows me the leg again. So I ask, what is this? silence. I got nothing. So again, I don't want to upset her. She's already been through enough trauma. She's already, you know, so upset. I'm not saying anything about the amputated leg. So going along, delivering other messages, not to do with the accident, but just delivering other messages. All of a sudden, boom, 
Third time, cat shows me the amputated leg. And I thought, the heck? And I would ask, what, what are you showing me? What is this? Nothing. I got no response, no reply, no explanation, nothing. Well, I have a rule in my work that if an animal sends a message to me three times, it must be important, so I must deliver it. So very carefully, I found the right words, and I said to her, I don't know how to say this to you, and I'm so sorry, but did your cat's leg have to be amputated after the accident? And I'm so sorry, but he keeps showing me an amputated leg, and it, it, but it's a human leg, and I don't, I don't mean to upset you, but he keeps showing it to me, so this must be important. Total silence on the phone. Nothing. Then all of a sudden, she starts sobbing. And it was the, <gasps> you know, she can't even catch her breath, sobbing. And I thought, oh, Karen, you really messed up this time. Shouldn't have said anything. Now look what you did. You caused this lady to be even more upset. Oh, why did I have to open my big mouth and say something? I should have just kept quiet. And I started apologizing. I said, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said it. I'm so sorry. She's like, no, 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 you don't understand. And I said, I don't understand. She said, no. And I said, what do you mean? I said, was this your cat's leg that got amputated? She said, no, Karen. She said, several months after he passed away, I was in a terrible car accident and my leg was amputated. And during my recovery, I felt my phantom leg and I felt him next to my phantom leg. Like he was trying to help me heal. Wow. That's powerful. I think about it now and it still blows me away. That, that just, think about that. Several months after the cat passed, and the cat was more concerned about her healing, wanted to talk about her and helping her. He was not concerned about what she had done to him because he knew it was not intentional. She would never do anything to harm him. She loved him. Never came up. Didn't want to talk about the accident, what happened to him. He wanted to talk about her and her amputated leg and her healing and that he was there for her even from the other side. Speaking of the other side, uh, what happens to animals, our pets, our loved ones when they move on? Well, I think the most important thing to realize is that we just, um, as humans, we're limited with our senses. So if we can't see it, feel it, touch it, or hear it, we think it's not here, it's gone. That could not be any further from the truth. The fact is, that the afterlife is a parallel dimension that literally overlaps our world. And at times we come into exact alignment. That's where you may see something out of the corner of your eye movement or your cat or your dog or a, a human spirit or loved one or something moving. And then when you look at it, poof, it vanishes, right? That's because of the cones and rods in our eyes. Our peripheral vision is able to capture that glimpse into the afterlife when everything aligns. So what has just helped me so much over the years is to realize they're not gone. They're still with us. They don't miss out on any events. They, they see everything that we're going through. They're with us through all the good times, but especially through the bad times. That's when they're really with us. If we're really missing them or if we're really hurting or if we're deep in pain or whatever it is, if we're having a really tough time in life, that's when our departed loved ones are with us the most. But our own limitations as the human animal keeps us from sensing them. Now, you might dream about them, have a dream visitation like what I write about in my new newest book, all the many ways that we can receive afterlife signs, dream visitations, or it's one of the most common ways because we're in our dream state, we're open to receive. We're not challenging that information as it comes in. We're just relaxed and we're dreaming and 
we just go with it, right? So that's how they let us know that they're still with us. You also might sense like just ever so slightly uh, a brushing. It may feel like cobwebs that run across you. You may feel it on your face and your hand. You might feel somebody brush against you. You might feel the, the furniture move, like they're jumping on or off the furniture. You might see little paw prints in the bed when you don't have any pets. That's always crazy, right? When you see that. There's just so many ways that they connect with us and reach out to us to let us know that they're still here, but we still want to jump to that conclusion of, oh, that can't be real. That's just my imagination. And I have to say that is so disheartening for them when we do that. It's like letting all the air out of the balloon. It just defeats. So don't do that. (laughs) Get excited. Thank them. Ask for more signs or say, you know, Kitty, if that was you, do it again. Or mom, if that was you, you know, move something. You have to get excited because that fuels them and it gets them excited that you heard, saw, or felt them. And then they'll send more messages. Is there a reincarnation with animals? There is. It does happen. Some animals have been with us just one time in this lifetime and other animals have been with us multiple times. And the way that you know the difference is, and this is why I wrote my newest book, there's that one pet that holds the key to your heart. There's something about them. You don't know what it is. You can't put your finger on it. But there's something so special about them. You love them all, but there is that one that just absolutely holds the key to your heart and soul. And that's what the pet I can't forget is all about. It's about how we are so connected to these guys. And the reason is because we have had multiple past lives together. So think about that. The more past lives you have together, the closer, more closely bonded your souls are. So of course, you're going to have a more meaningful experience in this lifetime where someone who you haven't been in as many past lives with, you aren't as closely bonded. You still love them, but you just don't have all that history. So yes, animals do reincarnate. They do come back to us, but reincarnation is a very, um, how would you describe it as a, it's not all the time. It doesn't happen all the time and you can't will it to happen. You can't beg for it to happen. It's either supposed to, or it won't happen. And and it's for spiritual growth. It's for what's in the best interest, first and foremost, of your companion animal and what's in the highest and best interest for your spiritual growth. So you have two levels of spiritual growth coming into play. So that's what determines it. Yeah. Thank you. Do uh, cats and dogs, for an example, have egos like And if they do, what's the difference between the human ego and the animal's ego? Well, there is, um, I'll say it's more of a human ego is unique to humans because our ego has an agenda behind it. So our human ego, and I say this not in a, in the bad way where you might say someone is real egotistical. I don't mean that. I mean, ego in the sense of, uh, Ego helps us, like in the early days of of mankind, ego helped us not get eaten by dinosaurs or fall off a cliff. Ego keeps us focused on our survival and taking care of the business in order to survive. That's the ego brain, and that's what propels us and motivates us and pushes us. It's what gets us to work in the morning. It's how we get to the grocery store. It's how we buy the items we need at the store. You know, that's ego. That's the part of us that is always working and trying to control everything in our lives. That's ego. So the opposite of ego would be like when you go on vacation and you kick back and relax and your toes are in the sand and you've got your little drink and you're relaxing and the sun is setting and the birds are chirping and the waves are washing up on you and you don't have a care in the world. So that's the opposite of that. So in the animal kingdom, animals are driven by things other than that kind of ego. They're driven by personality. They're driven by instinct. So an animal has 
a different set of um, traits. And I, I can't compare them to a human because they're just not the same. It's, it's a different kind of, of motivator. That's a good word. So they're motivated by different things. The human animal is definitely ego motivated. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings is, um, and I'm sure you heard it a number many times, but uh, be the person your dog thinks you are. You know, and I love that. And you may hear that dog is spe God spelled backwards. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, the spiritual teacher, wrote a book. I don't know if you've read it called The Guardians of Being. No, I haven't, but I have it on my to read list. Definitely. It's a great book because he talks about how it brings us back to our true essence, which is love unconditional love, That's presence, it. you know, being in the present moment and just appreciating your life for what it really is beyond the mental thinking. Yes. It's so true. It's, and it's, it's what our animals are here to help us do. If you notice that they want to sit on us or they want to be next to us or lean into us, most of them do. I mean, some don't, but most of the time they want just to be in our presence, right? That's all our animals want is our time, our attention, and our love. That's what they want. Play, some play, some don't, but they really just want us to be present with them, right? When's the last time, and I challenge your, your uh, followers, when's the last time you got on the ground or got on their level and played with them, like rolled around, played with them. I know for me, it's hard to get up anymore, but still <laughs> I'll get down there right on their level. I have little dogs. I have a little dog now. I used to have big dogs, but when's the last time you did that? I have very old cats, senior cats. They all still love to play. I get that wiggle wand feather toy out. <laughs> They're jumping all over the place. We tend to, as humans, get too far away from what are the needs of my animals and how can I best fulfill their need? We tend to think the opposite. This animal isn't fulfilling my needs, so I'm going to get rid of it, or I'm going to throw it outside, or I'm going to this, or I'm going to that. You know, I hope you don't do that. But instead, how can you fulfill your animal's life and needs to the highest extent? And that brings me to my next topic for you is that the proceeds from my books and my online animal communication course go to my nonprofit animal sanctuary, Painted Rain Ranch. And I created this ranch so that I could save the pets that nobody else wants, the ones that are overlooked at shelters the ones that have something physically wrong with them, like they're missing a limb or an eye or they're blind or they're deaf or they're diabetic or, and nobody wants them. I created a beautiful sanctuary here on my 30 acre ranch in Eastern Washington, where they can live out the rest of their lives in beautiful peace and harmony, loved part of my family. They never get adopted out. Once they're here, that's it. They stay They're They're part of my family. And I devote everything I have, my entire focus and purpose is to help them live a better life because they have been through so much turmoil at the hands of humans. I want them to experience the other side of humans, the goodness, the love. So if you have pets at home and you're watching this, what can you do to fulfill their life, to give them the best life you possibly can, instead of expecting them to live up to your standards and fulfill all of your needs, what can you do to help them? Because they're not human, they're animal. They have very different needs and very different motivators. Most of the time, it comes down to being present, like you said, being there to share affection and playtime and you know, get down on the ground and roll around with them and be silly and laugh and smile and go for walks and sit in the sun and go for rides. If you have horses, you know, there's just so much we can do as a pet parent. And I'm guilty that we don't do because of demands of family and career and life and health and all of these things. But even in small doses, you can make the lives of your animals so much better because don't they make our lives? so much better. 
I appreciate that. I appreciate your words because sometimes or sometimes often you find people treating animals like they're a piece of furniture, you know, and uh, they forget their life. Um, I love animals. I love life. Um, and uh, one more quick question, and this is a personal question um, before you go. Um, what would you, uh, any advice you would give me or anyone that's experiencing uh, bullying between cats when, uh, like my, my male cats are bullying one of my female cats and she's not accepted in the, to the pack. Do you have any advice for me? Absolutely. Yes. So the one thing to remember, <clears throat> cats are some of the most sensitive creatures on the planet. So there is a lot going on in that little cat brain. Most of the time it has to do with their surroundings. So you need to, first of all, set them up for success. What I mean by that is if you're having bullying or any other kind of fearfulness or whatever it is that an animal is displaying, what you think in your mind will affect the outcome of what happens under your roof. So for instance, if your cat is being bullied, what you need to do, first of all, is decide that all of your thoughts are going to be what you want to happen in the household with the cats. You have to think about a perfect, balanced relationship between all the cats. What does that look like? So next, you have to visualize all the cats getting along and being respectful. Maybe they don't have to like her, but they can avoid her. Just ignore her being respectful of each other's territory, space, personal space. So you're thinking what you want, you're visualizing only what you want, and everyone in the household has to be on the same page. You're also saying what you want. I know you're all going to get along just fine, and everyone's going to respect everybody's space. And then you have to feel it in your heart. You have to have that emotion and live in that moment of what it looks like when everybody is being kind and respectful and getting along. If any of these things I just shared with you are out of alignment, it's not going to work. So you have to be first. So whenever I had a behavioral problem and a client would come to me, I had to work on the client, not the animal. Because our preconceived thoughts will trigger things in the animal's mind because they're so sensitive. They can pick up on our thoughts. They know when they're going to the vet. They know when they're going for a walk. They know they know. Why? Because they can read our minds. So think about how we tend to think of the worst case scenario. You're probably thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to bully her. She's going to get scared. She's going to get picked on. And I'm just throwing some things out there. I don't know, but I'll bet you have it in your mind that. This is how it is. And they pick on her and poor thing. You know, I don't know if this is ever going to get resolved. Probably something like that, right? Exactly like that. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop <laughs> doing that. <laughs> you're, can, you're throwing fuel on the fire. So okay. you start with you. Get you into alignment. And then the next thing you do with a cat is, of course, you have to let them experience e each other in with positive experiences. So instead of only having negative experiences where the one cat is getting bullied and you do that with food and you do that with play. So food would be giving the cats a treat all at the same time within close enough proximity that they see each other, but they don't have to deal with each other. And then you move the treats a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Cats take time. You have to have patience with cats. And again, with like toys, when a cat watches another cat play, there are like endorphin-like things released in the brain that give them a feel-good feeling. So even if the cat isn't participating, just watching another cat play can in bring on feelings of joy and comfort. So again, you have to set the animals up for success. If you're having a behavioral problem, I hold you responsible. It starts with you and it ends with you. And there's something that you're missing within all of them 
that you need to shift, change, or modify in what you're currently doing. So it's like the definition of insanity, right? By Albert Einstein, you know, doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. (laughs) That's what we do, right? (laughs) I've done it. I know. You have to do something different. You have to shake it up a little bit, try some different things. And that's what I recommend. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, And I'll work on that. Do you have any last words for uh, your latest book? Maybe about your latest book, The Pet I Can't Forget? Yes, please, everyone, go out and buy a million copies of it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The Pet I Can't Forget is uh, filled with incredible stories from real people that have received messages from their pets from the afterlife, and they are incredible. It is also full of all the different signs they send, feathers and coins and songs and numbers and their name. It's amazing how many different incredible creative ways that animals will send signs to let you know that they're near. And I'm sure some of you listening are like, oh my God, I had that happen to me. So, um, and then in the last part of the book, which you haven't started it yet, so you don't know this, but the last part of the book are actual afterlife sessions conducted over the past 26 years that I've done. And you get to actually experience what goes on in a session and how the messages come through and how completely transformative they are, moving you from a place of very, very deep pain into, I could actually feel the healing start. I could feel the energy shift. And yes, it's got sad stories in it because (coughs) how could we (coughs) talk about pets passing away and not be sad? So, but every story, there is a beautiful and uplifting and incredible ending to every story. So it's very uh, heartwarming, very touching, very inspiring. I think you're going to learn things that you didn't know. You're going to discover things you never knew possible. It, It truly is healing. And it's, that's what I, my intention was for it to go out into the world and help people who are in that really dark place struggling with a loss, you can find hope and healing with signs from the afterlife. Karen Anderson, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. And happy holidays.